The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has ordained me to proclaim the good news to the poor. You may have noticed that the lessons were in a very different order than they normally are. Uh, That's because Pastor Preston and I decided to mix everything up for a little bit. There are about 14 weeks left in the common church season. Uh, That means that we'll be using the green pyramids for about 13, 14 more weeks. Then we'll change to red for a week for Reformation Sunday. Then we'll change to white for a couple of other small holidays. We'll go back to green, and then it's time for Christmas. Seems like the year's flying by pretty quickly. So I figured if we have that many weeks, why not do a sermon series? So we will be departing from the regular lectionary for a few weeks. We will take a break a couple times throughout the series, and I'll preach on the lectionary again, or Pastor Michael will be here while I'm on vacation. Um, But otherwise, we will be focusing in on the Ten Commandments. We're going to talk about what they are, what they mean. We're going to go through each and every single one every week. To reflect that, the lessons have been modified. Pastor Preston is using the same lectionary calendar that we sat down and created, and he'll be using the same lessons to preach the same series in his own words. So Christ the King and St. John are actually getting the same theme for a little bit, which is kind of interesting to think about. But today is a day to discuss the introduction to the Ten Commandments. To discuss where these came from, what they mean, why we still listen to them. Most importantly, what is the law? We talk about terms like law and gospel all the time, but what does that actually mean? To many, it means that the Old Testament is the law, the do's, the don'ts, the if you don't, then God will strike you dead. Versus the New Testament, which is the gospel, the good news, the glorious things that Jesus Christ has done for you. And i got to tell you, that's completely wrong. The law and the gospel are carried throughout the, entire, and the entirety of Scripture. To that end, Jesus Christ even says, Don't think that I have come to abolish the law, for I have not. Rather, I have come to fulfill it. I tell you, not the smallest letter will disappear from the law before heaven and earth have disappeared. The law continues even after we are in our justification, even as we are in the process of sanctification. But what is its rightful place? See, many people have come up with different ideas. Some say that the law is the Bible, B-I-B-L-E, basic instruction before leaving earth, or Uh, Basic instruction before living eternally. I don't like that one. It just deflates everything that scripture is. See, if all it is is basic instruction, then what about all of those things that we don't understand? If it's a bunch of do's and don'ts, what about Christ and him crucified for the forgiveness of sin? If all the law is is basic instruction, then we could find that anywhere. We don't need Christ for that. If you want basic instruction, i got to tell you, the Stoics do it really well. Marcus Aurelius and his meditations, top-notch. People have been studying that for generations. But if the law and scripture are something much more than basic instruction, then it's worth paying attention to. Then it's interesting. So let's look at what Moses has to say about the law that was given to the people. So imagine for a moment, the people of Israel are preparing to go into the promised land after 40 years of wandering in the desert, after an entire generation of people has passed away. Now the people who were little children, when the promise was made, when the covenant was cut with Israel, are ready to enter into the promised land. And Moses says something really interesting. The Lord your God made this covenant with us at Horeb. It was not with our ancestors that the Lord made this covenant, but with us, with all of us who are living here today. Even these children, although they were children, they were eyewitnesses to what God was doing, and now they're adults. And Moses and God are holding them to what they had seen, to what they had heard. To remind them of the covenant that was made, Moses repeats the Ten Commandments. There are two places to find the Ten Commandments in their entirety. In Exodus, 
and in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 5 is the turning point for the very long sermon that Moses gives that is the book of Deuteronomy. So within that, Moses explains to the people, this is what God has given us. This is what we are to walk in. These are the regulations, the rules. But they aren't ancient and they aren't removed from us. They belong to us. God has given them directly to us. Now we have the Ten Commandments. They've been handed down generation by generation, not from some ancients who may have gotten them wrong, but from eyewitnesses who passed them on to more eyewitnesses who passed them on and on and on. These are the commandments. And we know them, right? Confirmation was a long time ago, wasn't it? Kind of hard to remember. So every now and then we need a refresher course like this. Now for the sake of argument and for the sake of this series, we're going to be going through the commandments in the order that they appear in the catechism. Does everybody remember that? You shall have no other gods. Remember the Sabbath, uh, you should not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. See, I can't even do it. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not kill. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not desire your neighbor's property. And you shall not desire your neighbor's people. And that's ten. It's not easy to remember every single one of them. And we have to talk about what they mean. Because if you don't understand what these ten words mean, then there are contradictions everywhere. If you think that to murder and to kill are the same thing, you're going to find contradictions all throughout Scripture where God orders the death of people like the Amalekites. If you think that covetousness is only limited to trying to take something that's not yours, you're going to get swept away by it very quickly. If you think adultery is only done in the bedroom, you're going to be very disappointed. There's a lot to be said for these commandments. We have to study them and learn them as diligently as Moses ordered the people to do. But more than that, we need to understand how they affect us in our lives today. For Christ's sake, These apply to us in a very different way. Notice something here. None of these commandments say that you should do anything. There are no shoulds. There are no this would be nice. This is a shall. It's a statement of affirmation. It's not an imperative. Because we can't keep the Ten Commandments. We don't keep the Ten Commandments. But instead, God says, you shall, you will do this. How? How are we to do all of these things? Especially when you consider the things that Jesus had to say in the Sermon on the Mount. That if you hate your brother in your heart, you've already killed him. That if you look at a woman with lust, you've already committed adultery with her. How are we to keep these? Except for Christ's sake. See, the interesting thing about Jesus Christ is that he is the fulfillment of the law, as he said before. Jesus understood the law in a deeper and more true way than anyone else. And he copied Moses when he said, the two greatest commandments are these, love God with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second is like it, love the neighbor as yourself. Jesus knew that the fulfillment of the law is love. And that's what St. Paul told us in Romans, that the fulfillment of the law is love. Owe no one anything except that you love them. See, this is what the Ten Commandments become for us in Christ. Because Christ loved God and loved us perfectly. But if all it meant for Christ to save us, if all it took was for him to be perfect, then why the Incarnation? Because Jesus is God, and God is the fullness of perfection. Well, what we needed was a perfect human. The law is not something that we do. It's not something that we should do. It is what we 
are to be. It is what we will be. It is what Adam should have been. It is what God told Adam he would be. And he didn't. He failed. He deviated from factory settings. He fell away from the blueprint, from what God set as the parameters. You will not touch the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And yet he did. And creation was broken and shattered and fractured. And now all of humanity lives in sin. So when Christ came, he lived according to the blueprint. Not for his own justification, not to save himself because he was already perfect, but to be the perfect human. St. Paul says that Christ is a second Adam, a new Adam, who lived in every respect according to the law, just as Adam was designed to and didn't. And just as sin entered the world through one man, righteousness was able to enter through another. Christ, by perfectly fulfilling the law, by living exactly as the blueprint dictates, became the truest, most real human. It's kind of backwards to think about, isn't it? We always talk about Jesus being God, but guess what? He was as much human as he is God. So Christ became the perfect human. But if being a perfect human was all it took, why his death? Well, in his death, Christ became perfectly obedient to the will of the Father who sent him to die. And not only that, because he was perfect, because he didn't need to justify himself, he was able to love the neighbor perfectly. To love the neighbor even to the point of death. He loved you and gave his life to save you. Jesus literally loved you to death. How about that? So now you are justified for Christ's sake. And you have this law, these ten commandments that become a promise to you that in Christ you shall have no other gods because Christ is your God. Because he bought you, redeemed you, sanctifies you. You shall not take his name in vain because you glorify in his name. You shall remember the Sabbath and take it holy because you need to come back and hear the word again and hear the promise. You shall honor your father and your mother because they're God's ministers to you on earth. And all the way through the rest of the commandments, every bit of it becomes a promise to you. This is the new normal, as we said during COVID. This is what has become normal for you in Christ. That you now live the law to love your neighbor, not for your own justification, not so that you can get to heaven. Luther said, God does not need your good works, but your neighbor most certainly does. Everything you do in the law, you do for the neighbor. Because you are free in Christ to love the neighbor. This is sanctification. That you should live the holy and chaste life that Christ has prepared for you in his death and resurrection. As we continue through this sermon series, you'll hear how Christ has done this for you. And now you are free to love the neighbor as you had loved yourself. This is the point of this sermon series, to find Christ in the law for you. Amen. Hello, I'm Vicar Aaron Dawson, and I hope that you heard comfort, forgiveness, and the promises of Christ in this sermon. For more sermon videos like this, information about our church, and promises of Christ, you can visit us at sjlc metro.com that's s j l c m e t r o .com thank you and god bless you and keep you in his grace